Welcome to this session on murder and justice stories of true crime. My name's Lisa Tate. I'm a historian at the LDS Church History Library, specialist in women's history. Um, and I'll be chairing this session in which we will hear first from Kenneth L. Cannon II, also known as Ken. And he'll be speaking on uh, murder in Forestdale, as you can see up here. Ken is a lawyer in private practice and an independent historian in Salt Lake City. He's published 20 articles in professional journals on historical subjects, occasionally winning awards. And I've read many of his articles and, and, very, and enjoyed them. He sometimes teaches at local law schools and has published and lectured widely on corporate bankruptcy and commercial law. And then we will hear from Linda Thatcher, who will speak about Lester Weyer, the inventor of the traffic light. Uh, Linda graduated from Utah State University uh, with a bachelor's degree and BYU with a master's degree in library science. She worked for the Division of State Utah State History for many years. She's the co-editor of a really nifty little book called Women in Utah History, Paradigm or Paradox, which is something I've used in my work quite a bit. She's prepared biographical sketches for the database of, the, um, of suffragists for the uh, NAWSA suffragists, 1890 to 1920. And she served as a narrator for a segment about Lester Weyer on a BYU TV special called Utah Famous Firsts. Uh, then finally, we'll hear from Becca Wiederholt from the BYU Library. She'll be speaking about pardon for murder, Jared Dalton, the assassin of old mother Parker. I mean, we're all going to go home and watch Blue Bloods tonight, right? <laughs> so we might as well just enjoy some real life crime before we, you know, go indulge in the fictional kind. Uh, Rebecca is the Technical Services Archivist at BYU's Harold B. Lee Library. She has a master's degree in library science with a specialization in digital content management from the University of North Texas. Her research interests include archival description, family history, Mormonism, and local and Utah state history. So we will proceed in that order, and um, when, we're fin when the speakers finish, I have a few short comments that will get the, the discussion period rolling and we should have some time for questions and answers. So we'll hold questions until everyone has spoken. Okay? All right. Yes, Lisa. Should this works. It works. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah. I am so technophobic, you have to understand. Good afternoon. In early December 1901, Peter Mortensen was an up-and-coming architect and builder. His design for the LDS uh, uh, Ward House in his home, Forestdale Ward, had just been chosen in a competition, and he was engaged as, a, as the contractor to build it. He had won a contract to remodel the Sumner School, one of the new public schools in downtown Salt Lake City. He was the architect and contractor on a number of substantial uh, house project, projects. Mortensen may not have been as quite as successful at running his business. He owed more than $3,800 to Pacific Lumber Company for lumber and building supplies. The manager of the lumber store, George E. Romney, known as Ernest, was pressing for payment, though he had made clear that he was amenable to Mortensen paying it over time. Mortensen had given a note to Pacific Lumber for $650 and granted a mortgage on his new home on the northwest corner of Simpson and Walnut Avenues, what Walnut is now called Lake Street. They changed the name, I think, probably because of this murder, actually. Kitty Corner from Mortensen's home lived James R. Ray, second in command of Pacific Lumber and a close friend of Mortensen. Jimmy, as he was known, was an ambitious young Australian convert to Mormonism who had married into one of the most prominent families in the city by wedding Aggie Sharp, uh, the daughter of James and Elizabeth Sharp. Things changed tragically and forever uh, later that month when Hay was brutally murdered on the night of December 16, 1901. Peter Mortensen was arrested for murder a day later after Hay's body was found in a shallow grave in, a, in an undeveloped field several blocks from their homes. The stories of the murder of Hay and the arrest, trial, and execution of Mortensen are relatively well known. What has not been discussed is that Mortensen likely did not receive a fair trial, that the case presented against him was entirely <coughs> circumstantial, and that he was ultimately convicted by supposed fi facts and theories developed by law enforcement officers and shared freely with journalists 
or from the earliest point in the investigation to sway public opinion. Many of these reports were not based on evidence that, could have, that would have been admissible in court. Later, on the eve of trial, during a laborious jury selection process, there were even news stories that Mortensen had confessed the murder to a cellmate. <clears throat> if there was a case in which a careful prosecutor and wise law enforcement officers should have withheld information on, an, on a pending investigation, this was it. Can you hear my... There, maybe that's better, talking to the mic. The extraordinary uh, publicity which resulted in over 1,100 potential jurors being subpoenaed for jury duty and all but 12 being excused from serving on the jury for cause based on their bias, with a few peremptorily challenged, made a fair trial virtually impossible. Charles Varian, longtime territorial district attorney for the United States in Salt Lake City, who had re relentlessly pursued and prosecuted more than polygamous in the, in the 1880s, spoke out against the unfair treatment of Mortensen. Long before trial, Varian pro protested that, quote, the open and flagrant violation of the law, end quote, in the treatment of Mortensen, his personal papers, and his wife by the, quote, sleuths, official and volunteer, uh, who were investigating him. Law enforcement had ruthlessly destroyed the constitutional privilege of, quote, sacred confidences of man and wife, End quote, and had threatened his wife with prosecution quote, to extort evidence to convict her husband. In sum, Varian wrote, quote, The constitutions of the United States and of this state prohibit any compelling of an accused person to give evidence against himself. A wife is not permitted to testify against her husband. The private papers of a citizen cannot be seized and given in evidence directly or indirectly against him. So the Supreme Court of the nation in expounds this uh, constitutional clause of, of uh, protection and privilege, there can be no reliance reposed upon the supposed maxim, quote, that the end justifies the means, end quote. Some of Varian's arguments, frankly, are exaggerated, but his outrage appears to have been well-founded. What did the prosecutors uh, present to the jury during the trial? Let me describe what is almost certainly the quirkiest and most unusual murder trial in the history of Utah and to its time was probably the highest profile murder trial in Utah. And this all occurred um, uh, in you know, 1901 to 1903 uh, time frame. Peter Mortensen was, in the Desert News' words, quote, the sinusure of all eyes, end quote, at both the preliminary hearing and at trial. He remained, quote, as cool and collected as his lawyers, end quote, as a lawyer's as the lawyers, and never, quote, winced or changed color for an instant, end quote, under the, quote, searching gaze of hundreds. The prosecution presented its case as a strong chain of links. As witnesses told the story, on Monday, December 16, 1901, Peter Mortensen spent part of the early evening with Ernest Romney and Jimmy Hay at Pacific Lumber's offices at 223 West South Temple. Mortensen claimed to have collected sufficient funds to pay his debt of $3,800 to, uh, to the lumber company. About 650 of the total was secured by a mortgage that, uh, on his new home, which would come due soon. Oddly, Mortensen wanted to pay Hay that evening and suggested that Hay visit him after they returned to their houses. Romney, the lumber store's manager, cautioned against this, instructing Hay to wait until Tuesday morning to collect payment. Romney's accounts to the newspapers varied on the question of whether the, uh, uh, whether the receipt Hay took home with him to give Mortensen when he received the money was signed at the Pacific Lumber Office or whether it was blank uh, to be signed later. In a subsequent account he gave to the Salt Lake Herald a day or two later, Romney suggested that Hay had pre-signed the receipt. Hay also took the original promissory note from the company's office so that he could mark it, quote, canceled, end quote, once he received payment. By most accounts, Hay and Mortensen took the same Calder's Park streetcar for home from the corner of South Temple and West Temple and reportedly sat together with two other men who conversed with Peter and Jimmy during the ride to Forestdale, located south of what was then called 12th South. How many of you know that 2100, 21st South used to be called 12th South? It's 2100 South, along 7th East. The conductor of the car or thought he overheard heard Hay telling Mortensen that he would visit him that evening, but he could not be sure. However, Aggie Sharp Hay, Jimmy's wife, testified at both the preliminary hearing and at, and at trial that Jimmy had come home and told her that he was going to visit Mortensen that night to collect $3,800 to, 
because Morton had told him he was leaving in the morning. Hay then took a light dinner and left uh, home about 7, 8.45 p.m. to visit Mortensen. He never returned home. The most sensational testimony of the trial was given by James Sharp, the father-in-law of uh, Jimmy Hay, who was a prominent businessman, politician, and church leader whose uh, mansion was on South Temple. In response to questions from defense counsel, Sharp related that on December 17, 1902, the day after the murder, he had visited Peter Mortensen in his home. Mortensen showed Sharp where he and Hay had sat as Mortensen counted out, as he said, $190 $20 gold pieces, representing the $3,800. He said he had kept the gold in the cellar of the house. Mortensen told Sharp that Hay then placed the gold in his pockets until they were full and took the rest in a sack. The two passed through the kitchen on, the, on their way out of the house, seeing Peter's wife, Ruth Mortensen, and his sister-in-law, Lizzie Mortensen, as they passed through. Mortensen then told Sharp that Hay left the house through the side door and walked towards the street. Sharp retraced the men's steps with Mortensen. Near the outside door, Sharp asked Mortensen where he had last seen Hay. Uh, Mortensen uh, walked down the steps and indicated the spot. Sharp then tested, testified that he said, quote, Peter Mortensen, if that is the last place you saw my living son, that is the place he was killed, end quote. After the, after the two then inspected the cellar together, they went back to the same spot. Sharp then said, quote, Peter Mortensen, there is where you killed James R. Hay, end quote. When Mortensen asked how Sharp knew Hay was dead, Sharp replied, quote, the truth will be that his dead body will be dug up within 24 hours within a mile from here in one of these fields, end quote. When Sharp responded to defense counsel Barnard Stewart that that was the place where Mortensen uh, had killed uh, Hay, Stewart replied sharply, how do you know it? Sharp quickly and confidently stated, God revealed it to me. This gets better. When came the rejoinder from the defense counsel? There in that yard. How did he tell it to you? This is God telling him. By telling me. How did he tell it to you? He told me by the utterances of my mouth. In what manner did he tell it? To this, Sharp elaborated a bit. Quote, he told me, as proof to Peter Morrison, he had killed my son. He was the man that killed him. His dead body would be dug up within 24 hours, within a mile of that place, buried in one of these fields. End quote. Stewart responded, did God appear in person? End quote. At this point, Sharp repeatedly told Stewart to ask God himself until the judge ordered him to answer. Finally, Sharp testified he had not seen God, but that God had been there, uh, quote, by the power of his spirit and told me." End quote. Incidentally, Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, who had a deep interest in both criminology and spiritualism, included an account of Sharp's testimony in this trial in a book discussing spiritual manifestations in murder trials entitled The Edge of the Unknown, which was the last book Arthur Conan Doyle published in his life. At trial, through extensive hearsay evidence describing Mortensen's account of Hayes' visit, was given by Sharp and others, no evidence was presented of Mortensen's having left his home after he showed Hay outside. Newspaper accounts had, however, earlier reported that Mortensen had walked his sister-in-law, Lizzie Mortensen, home after Hay left. They also reported that Ruth Mortensen originally told uh, police that she and Lizzie Mortensen had seen Hay leave the house carrying a heavy sack and that Peter had come home soon after escorting Lizzie home a few houses away. P um, police did not believe her initial story and threatened to charge her as an accessory to murder. Under this pressure, she talked again to police and convinced them that she was not involved. She then left with her children to go stay with her brother, uh, Richard Wilkins, uh, Richard Watkins, uh, in Provo. This must have been difficult for her because Peter was by all accounts a doting husband to her and father to their four young children. After moving to Provo, she told a friend that Peter had actually been gone almost an hour uh, after Hay left and that um, there was plenty of time, and she was not satisfied with his explanation of where he had been. This additional time afforded Mortensen an opportunity to kill and bury Hay. Apparently, Ruth was convinced of her husband's guilt. The friend immediately passed this privileged hearsay along, and police promptly shared this information with journalists with the assertion that this was the final proof that prosecutors needed to convict Mortensen. None of this was presented at trial or the preliminary hearing, because the reports had originated with Ruth. 
None of this um, was presented. Um, though prosecutors tried to elicit hearsay evidence regarding Ruth's testimony, the judge properly did not permit it. This is spousal, uh, uh, spousal privilege. The, the wife couldn't testify against her husband. What prosecutors did present was testimony showing inconsistencies in Mortensen's accounts. To some he had said the gold he had given Hay had been in three jars in the basement. To others he said it was loose or in a sack. Mortensen told one man that he asked Hay to come to his house that night, but he told another that Hay had come unbidden to collect the debt. Witnesses also attacked the credibility of his story. He had said <clears throat> that the two men had counted out the gold at a small settee. The settee was an exhibit at trial, and the prosecutors, the prosecutor, Dennis Eichnor, and ex-detective George Sheets, quote, both large men tried to sit at the settee, at the settee which they could not com comfortably do, end quote. It's, this, is, this is OJ, you know, if, if it fits, you know. Um, it's not clear why this demonstration should have had been effective because Hay weighed only 130 pounds and Mortensen was not a large man. This is just, this is, if it fits, you must convict, okay? Mortensen said, if it doesn't fit, you must convict. Mortensen had said that 3,800 in gold had filled up three quart jars, but a banker called as a prosecution witness demonstrated that $3,800 in $20 gold pieces would not fill even one quart jar. More important, two important two prosecution witnesses testified about timing. One, Joseph Jensen, who lived on 12th South, again, 2100 South, between 7th and 8th East, told him how he had heard a gunshot wound, a gunshot at 9.30 p.m. made from within 100 feet of the grave found on December 18th, even though Jensen was in his house half a mile away. He could pinpoint exactly when and where it was. <laughs> Newspapers had earlier reported that a number of Forestdale residents had heard what they thought was a gunshot in the neighborhood sometime around 10 p.m., but Jensen somehow knew the precise, the precise time and the spot where a gun had been discharged. The other witness was perhaps the most important witness in Mortensen's trial. John Allen testified that as he operated his streetcar north on 7th East at about 10.15 p.m. on December 16th, he came to the railroad crossing of the Park City line of the Rio Grande Western Grade at about 2200 South. No, it's farther south, and that's more like, I don't know where it is. It's close. It's where the S line runs now, if you know that the streetcar. The Park, the Park City line ran east-west perpendicular to, south, to 7th East uh, and the streetcar line. Streetcars were legally, legally required to stop at railway crossings. Allen identified, testified he saw a man walking west along the railroad grade. Allen was concerned that the man might be a, quote, spotter, end quote, one who checked to see if streetcars were stopping at railway crossings, so he looked carefully at the man. This is 10, 15 p.m. in the middle of the winter. It is dark. The, the, they even had testimony from someone that said the little quarter moon had already set, okay? Uh, so, um, after he had passed the tracks and the car's lights no longer illuminated the area to his side, he said that the man who was 60 or 70 feet away from him and looked to be carrying something like a shovel uh, turned momentarily and showed his face. Allen said he immediately recognized the man as Mortensen, whom he had often seen riding the streetcar. This is the central evidence in this case. <clears throat> this was extraordinary given the dark winter night with a sliver of moon that was just about to set in the distance. But Allen was convinced and would not be moved from his eyewitness testimony by intense cross-examination from defense counsel. Allen's story had been publicized in December without his name, although it was reported that the, quote, motor man, end quote, quote, would not swear he was the man for fear his testimony might hang an innocent man. That's what he said in December, six months before the trial, end quote. Allen's sketchy eyewitness testimony was the only, true evi the only trial evidence purporting to show that Mortensen had left his house after seeing Hay was out after seeing Hay out and was therefore critical. Brilliantly in his summation, the district attorney simply argued that it was natural for Mortensen to have turned around when the streetcar passed. Not that this was the only evidence the prosecution had presented of Mortensen being outside his home after Hay left. As almost everyone in the courtroom knew, however, <clears throat> newspaper articles had reported hearsay accounts that Peter had left to escort his sister-in-law home but had been gone for almost an hour. Now, this was never in the trial. After, after Allen's testimony placed Mortensen just where he might have been as he returned from hastily burying Hay's body in a lonely field. Frank Torgerson testified of finding the shallow grave 
and the grisly scene of the bloody body of the young businessman buried there. The grave was on the other side of a barbed wire fence uh, from the Park City Line tracks, and it appeared that whoever buried Hay's body to the site, carried Hay's body to the site, had thrown the body over the fence, then buried his body in a shallow grave in the snow. It appeared that an adze, or square-bladed square shovel, had been used to dig the grave. There were mysterious footprints going in different directions. Officials theorized that the killer was very strong to be able to throw Hay's body over the fence, and some, uh, some believed he must have had an accomplice. Officers originally thought that Hay had died from a blow to his head or fall on his head, but they soon found a large gunshot wound a few inches behind his ear, showing that the unfortunate man had been shot uh, from behind. They originally assumed that the bullet came from Mortensen's 32 caliber handgun that they had found in a search of his house, but later realized that it was a 38 caliber bullet, caliber bullet which had killed uh, uh, Jimmy Hay. Hay's gold watch was still in his pocket, and some testified that it looked like a pocket. But some testified that it looked like a pocket that contained the receipt for Mortensen's payment of thirty-eight hundred dollars had been pulled out of by the killer's bloody finger. Although there was no testimony that the receipt, which was in evidence, had blood on it. This all proved to detectives that Hay had not been robbed and had, had not been carrying a large sum in gold coins. Rather, he had been killed by Mortensen to hide the fact that Mortensen had not paid his debt to Pacific Lumber. A shovel played a role in the evidence. When Torgerson found what looked like a shallow grave, he went to Mortensen's house and Peter had handed him a short-handled shovel with a round blade, saying that was his only shovel. Later, investigators found a long-handled shovel with a square blade in Mortensen's barn. Police believed the grave had been done with an axe or square-bladed shovel. Mortensen seemed to be hiding this shovel, suggesting his guilt. Prosecutors finished by presenting evidence regarding Mortensen's finances to support a motive that he might have had for killing Hay. The books appeared to show that Mortensen had not collected sufficient funds to have paid Hay $3,800 on the fateful night. Uh, and then they went through some uh, uh, lots of testimony about records of, of Mortensen that they had used to try to prove that. No one seriously questioned whether prosecutors had presented a full picture of Mortensen's cash for the past four or five months, even though it was generally acknowledged that Mortensen was not depositing funds into bank accounts because he did not want those funds garnished and he was hiding assets. Uh, though defense counsel argued that Mortensen owned property that he could have sold, prosecutors cleverly covered that the possibility of Mortensen uh, concealing other uh, funds by eliciting the testimony that Peter Mortensen had asked his brothers-in-law, his wife's brothers, to tell police that they had loaned him $1,000 or $1,500 to help show that he had sufficient funds uh, to pay Hay. Mortensen assured Roos Brothers he had the money to pay Hay and had done so, but that he needed to personally review his records to prove this. Judge Charles Morse, who tried the case, later wrote to the Utah Board of Pardons that although he believed the trial had been fair and the jury properly convicted Mortensen, the evidence against Mortensen was, quote, purely circumstantial, end quote, and he did not think anyone should be executed solely on circumstantial evidence. Despite extraordinary efforts, the prosecution never found a murder weapon or provided any evidence of how Mortensen might have come into the possession of such a firearm. It found no blood on Mortensen, his clothes, or in his house, even though it was clear that, that Hay had bled profusely, and his killer, who dragged or carried him a long way, would have had blood all over him. The prosecution supposed evidence of the receipt being taken from Hayes' coat pocket with a bloody finger was undermined because the receipt had no blood on it. There was no evidence of Mortensen leaving his house other than the motorman's questionable uh, testimony of seeing him, which simply wasn't credible. The prosecution realized that it could not force Ruth Mortensen to testify that Peter had been gone for an hour after he left with his sister-in-law, Lizzie Mortensen. At a profound level, more, uh, prosecutors expected jurors to rely on earlier newspaper accounts. At the conclusion of the prosecution's case, Mortensen and his lawyer surprised almost everyone by calling only three witnesses, all for the purpose of casting doubt on John Allen, the motorman's uh, account of seeing Mortensen along the railroad tracks. Mortensen did not testify, but it is more, complexing, more perplexing that his sister-in-law, Lizzie Mortensen, who believed he was innocent and might have been given him an alibi, did not testify either. Mortensen's wife, Ruth, did not t also did not testify, she also never went to see him or let their children see him after he was arrested, although she occasionally promised in the papers to do so. 
One of the principal reasons that the Salt Lake Tribune later reported that 99 out of 100 Salt Lakers believed Mortensen was guilty was that by every indication, Ruth Mortensen believed her husband had murdered Jimmy Hay. Everyone who read the newspapers knew that Ro Ruth told them told police something that convinced them that Mortensen was guilty. A number of potential jurors had indicated that they believed Mortensen was guilty because his wife had deserted him. There were other reasons why everyone thought he was guilty. Most assumed that Mortensen did not have the money and killed Hay to cover that up. Some believed James Sharp's revelation. Uh, uh, others believed that if Hay had been robbed, his watch would have been taken he, and he would not have been buried. Most found Mortensen's failure to testify in his own behalf suspicious. Perhaps his lawyers later regretted this decision, but they may have believed they could convince the jury that the state had not met its burden of proof to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he had murdered Hay. Some probably believed the story of a supposed confession. There was a late newspaper account of a potential alternative uh, suspect or accomplice, but he had left the state and reportedly had an alibi. Defense theories were unpersuasive. The Utah Supreme Court denied Mortensen's appeals, two appeals, though the court delayed execution, but some of its analysis is not particularly impressive. Mortensen gave a long speech, though not under oath, at the hearing on his second motion for a new trial in which he insisted on his innocence and how he could, would be able to prove it and complained about the unfair treatment he had received in his trial. It was eloquent and moving but also rambling, just as his lawyers probably feared his testimony would have been if he had been called as a witness. The Board of Pardons refused to commute his sentence. Governor Heber Wells spent an afternoon talking to Mortensen but refused to grant a reprieve. District Attorney Dennis Eichner published an article the day before the execution in which he assured everyone that Mortensen was guilty, though he did not say anything about whether he had been fairly tried. The Forestdale Ward had a second competition and built a different church, though on the foundation Mortensen had designed and built. On November 21, 1903, Mortensen was blindfolded, led to the yard of the Utah State Prison in Sugar House, just a few blocks away from where all this happened, and executed at 10.31 a.m. Every newspaper of any size in Utah reported the execution as did the New York Times. One is left to wonder if the state met its burden in the case, but it didn't matter. The jury had convicted him, quote, in the most noted murder case in Utah's history, and the firing squad carried out its decision. I need to put it to the whole screen too. <laughs> criminals today, but I think that I can fit my paper <laughs> to it. We take many things for granted that have not always existed, including traffic laws, signage, and traffic lights that encourage safe driving practices. Have you ever wondered how traffic was controlled before the traffic light? What happened when cars met at an intersection? Who had the right of way? Excessive speeding on the roads has always been an issue in Salt Lake City. As early as 1851, a resolution was included in the municipal laws for Great Salt Lake, whereas fast riding and driving in the city has become a source of great annoyance to most of our citizens. It has therefore become the imperative duty of all marshals, sheriffs, constables, and policemen living in this city 
to aid the council in checking this evil by stepping forward and arresting with or without process all persons guilty of fast riding or driving in any of the streets of our city. In the early 1900s, automobiles were just starting to appear on the streets of Salt Lake City, joining horses and buggies and trolley cars. Pedestrians, as more and more vehicles appeared on the roads, traffic problems began to escalate. Lester Farnsworth Wire was a key person responsible for improving the safety of automobiles and pedestrians in early Salt Lake City. Lester was born in Salt Lake City on September 3, 1887. His parents were Charles Franklin Charles Wire and Lida Farnsworth Wire. His mother was born in Pleasant Grove, Utah, and his father in Hudson, Michigan. His father moved to Utah around 1885 and worked as a traveling agent and salesman for Davis County Nurseries. His mother was active in the Daughters of the American Revolution, Service Star, Catholic Women's League, and the Daughters of the American Colonists. He had one sister, Edith, who was a music teacher. The family was active in the Roman Catholic Church. Lester attended Salt Lake High School, where he was a folk football star and expert marksman. He also helped organize the first high school boys and girls, girls basketball teams. After graduating from high school in 1909, he received an appointment to West Point, but due to circumstances beyond his control, he was unable to enroll in the academy. He enrolled at the University of Utah as a law student. He found that tuition was too expensive and quit to take a job with the Salt Lake City Police in 1910. Okay. Lester served as a patrolman for many years. One of the most famous cases that he was involved in was Rafael Lopez. On November 21, 1913, Lopez shot and killed a fellow miner named Juan Valdez in Bingham, Utah. Four lawmen were sent to try and find him on the same day. The day ended in further tragedy as Lopez <coughs> ambushed the lawmen, killing three of them. News of the murder spread quickly and lawmen assembled to look for him. Lopez hid in the mini silver mine and despite many attempts, the lawmen were unable to locate him. Patrolman Lester Wire, Diamond Phil Jack Davis, and A.L. Cooley Corey were acquainted with Lopez. All three were expert gunmen and were sent to look for Lopez. And this is Le a picture of Lester oh. in the newspaper ba banishing his gun. He had been one of the <coughs> people. and they were sent to look for Lopez. The search lasted until January 2nd, 1914. Although they had sightings of Lopez, they never found him, and it is thought that he escaped. Uh, some thought that he had died in the mine, but um, there was no proof of this. He was never seen in Utah again. It is believed that Lopez died in Texas in 1921. Lester's claim to fame, though, is as the inventor of the traffic light. This came about after Lester, at the age of 24, was appointed by Police Chief B.F. Grant in 1912 to head the first traffic squad. In addition to his other duties, to help solve the escalating traffic issues on the streets of Salt Lake City. Until Lester was, and this is Lester right here, until Lester was appointed to the traffic squad, there had never been a police traffic patrol in Salt Lake City. Streetcars stopped wherever they liked to let passengers off. Cars made their U-turns anywhere, and vehicles traveled on either side of the street. Pedestrians were fair game and had to cross the street quickly or be run down, just like today. <laughs> <laughs> As head of the traffic squad, Lester's job was to bring order out of chaos. 
He started by writing Salt Lake City's first traffic regulation. Uh, whenever there was a traffic accident before this, a patrolman walking the beat would settle it. Lester could see that traffic problems were getting bigger and needed more manpower. So he appointed a patrolman to stand at the busy intersection of 2nd South and Main Street to direct traffic. The patrolman stood on a small platform in the middle of the intersection to direct the flow of traffic. <clears throat> In order to be fair, the patrolman timed the traffic going each way, giving each direction an equal amount of time. Traffic patrolmen had to stand in all kinds of weather for many hours. Concerned about the long hours and poor working conditions, uh, Lester wanted to find a better way co to con control traffic. After experimenting, he came up with the design for what he believed to be the world's first electric traffic signal. The traffic signal consisted of a square wooden box with a slanted roof, painted a bright yellow and containing red and green lights inset on each of the four sides. It was mounted on a tall pole, pole and placed in the middle of the intersection and connected to the electric lines used by the trolley cars. The signal was operated with a two-way switch by a patrolman standing at its base. At first, the signal was a novelty and even a joke in the local community. No one wanted to stop for a flashing birdhouse. People <laughs> stood on the corner just to watch it. Needless to say, Lester became very discouraged. However, a few citizens thought it was an improvement and wanted more place around the city. People from larger cities were impressed by the light, but local residents thought it a curiosity and a nuisance. Pedestrians would yell at drivers waiting in cars for the light to change. Are you waiting to see if the birdie will come out? Or, I saw a birdie that time, now you can go. The traffic light became known as Wire's Bird Cage or Wire's Pigeon House. Sometimes officers arrived to find that the light had been knocked over and destroyed during the night. And this was true of almost anything that they put up. They, they, the next morning they would go and find it had been destroyed. But at the time when it went on, the signal became better accepted and Lester kept trying to improve it. In 1914, a patrol platform was attached to the side of the light pole at the corner of the intersection where the traffic light was located. An officer sat in the cupola or the coop, as it was called, and controlled the light from there. An umbrella was placed over the top to protect the patrolman from the weather. By 1916, Lester was tired of trying to control the Salt Lake City streets with substandard devices, and he said, what we want is no more experiments. We have, we have had enough of those. I am going to ask that five of these semaphores be bought and installed on Main Street at 1st, 2nd, and 3rd South, and at the intersections of 2nd South and 3rd South and State. Cost of the signals were around $180 each. The most, and the paper also reported that the most modern traffic equipment in the country was scheduled to arrive in November of 1916. With the new signals, officers will control traffic in severe weather from a sheltered canopy at the base of each semaphore, Lester report, reported. The installation of semaphores was just a small portion of Lester's responsibility. It was his charge to write and enforce traffic laws for Salt Lake City. The traffic ordinances he wrote went in, into effect in 1915. By June 1916, the activities of, of the traffic squad had increased so much that Lester, now a sergeant, was assigned wholly to enforcing the traffic ordinances. He had Salt Lake City install signage such as drive slow, no parking here, and stop when cars stop. And I'm not sure what that means. But <laughs> Targeting corners with high accident rates, a sign was placed at First Avenue and East Street warning drivers to slow down to eight miles an hour. Red zones were painted under fire hydrants and a conspicuous sign, keep away next to the hydrant. 
Faced with an increasing congestion in downtown and drivers parking their cars on the streets all day, in November of 1916, it was estimated that 6,800 cars passed up and down Main Street each day and 7,000 cars on Saturday. Complaints were made by business owners that customers could not shop in their stores as there was no turnover in the parking. A newspaper article in the Salt Lake Herald stated, don't take your automobile downtown if you can't move it every hour. The traffic ordinance stated, no person shall between the hours of 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. except on Sundays and holidays allow any vehicle to stand longer than one hour upon the following streets and they give a list of the streets. Visitor violators will be taken to the police headquarters and made to answer for this violation in the city court. Rules for pedestrians were also drafted by Lester. They included look both ways before crossing the street, cross at the regular crossing, not diagonally or in the middle of the block. Always obey the traffic officer's commands. Keep your eyes open for streetcars, autos, and wagons. When alighting from a streetcar, never go behind it unless the way is clear. Do not jump on or off a moving streetcar. When carrying an umbrella, do not permit it to obstruct your view. Do not carry a cane or umbrella under your arm and always keep to the right. Other laws included having a current license plate, posting speed limits. Each city and town in Utah had their own speed limits. Signage to encourage pedestrians to walk straight across from corner to corner and not cut at the intersections with signs saying, walk this way. To encourage learning the laws so that the citizens of Salt Lake City could be safer drivers. <clears throat> Lester supported a state law compelling all automobile drivers to pass a state test as to efficiency, as other states have done. He also proposed that the city offer a prize for the best woman driver. <laughs> Wire stated, there are many women drivers in Salt Lake, but all are not equally skillful in running their machines. <laughs> Some are said to be reckless, and it is very hard for a traffic officer to reprimand a woman. <laughs> and so he proposed offering a prize for the champion woman driver. The contest started in November of 1916 and ran through the end of the year. The participants were required to demonstrate their knowledge of traffic rules and regulations. They also had to display their knowledge of how to respond to an emergency, as well as overall driving skills. He also offered free instruction to any automobile drivers who had questions on whether their equipment corresponds to the law. Salt Lake City drivers could come to the Public Safety Building for free instruction. He also promoted safety for children. It was reported in the Salt Lake Telegram. With the dawn of tomorrow, the traffic squad of Salt Lake City Police Department will give attention to minimizing traffic accidents in which children are the central figures either as a victim or the contributing cause. And this is kind of my favorite part. <laughs> His least, and I wish you could, these are not good pictures, but I wish you could see this little boy's face. His least favorite driver is what he called the infant or juvenile drivers. These were children under 16 who were driving. Wire said, there has been altogether too much of this allowed in Salt Lake City. He continued, parents are greatly to blame, though often boys will take a machine out when the parents are not home. These rules, forbids children driving even when accompanied by parents or older persons. Wire stated that age is not a good measure of efficiency. For instance, it is against the law for a youth under 16 years of age to drive a car. Now I have a list of several boys of that age who are undersized and wholly incapable to drive a car that can hardly be seen in the big seat. In the winter of 1916, Lester devised a plan to try and prevent children from being hurt in coasting or sledding accidents. He designated certain streets 
as coasting streets and placed a red flag with a flag um, at the bottom of the street. And you can see that on the right hand corner. When the flag was up, drivers were supposed to stop and look for coasters before entering the intersection. When it was down, they could proceed through without stopping. Despite Lester's efforts to have a safe place for children to sled, it was reported in the Salt Lake Tribune that despite the warnings issued by the police, many juveniles last night attempted to make slides on many of the prominent thoroughfares. And if they are caught, their sleds would be confiscated. He proposed closing the roads in front of several schools, and this is one of the signs, official warning, school ground, slow to eight miles an hour. Um, he would do the, he closed the streets off during lunch hours and recesses, and so that the kids could um, play out in the street. Uh, he. Some of the he also wrote some laws for the uh, children as well. He said, "Do not play in the roadway, play on the sidewalk or on the nearest playground or vacant lot. Never chase a ball across the street. Don't hitch on autos, trolleys, or wagons. Don't coast where autos or trolleys go. Don't play around autos or touch any of the levers. Never touch wire of any tie." at any time or place. Do not fear the policemen. They will help you and protect you. Never run behind a standing trolley car. There may be another car or auto approaching on the other side. Lester's life changed in May of 1917 as World War I progressed. He enlisted as a first sergeant in the ambulance corps, which were being recruited by Dr. H. B. Sprague. The Motor Ambulance Company was comprised of 100 men and known as the American Red Cross Ambulance Company No. 27 in Salt Lake City. They finally made it to France uh, in October of 1918 and returned to Utah in January of 1919. Lester was discharged on January 31, 1919 at Camp Grant, Illinois. When he returned to Salt Lake City in 1919, the man who had replaced him as traffic sergeant did not want to give him his job back. So Lester walked the beat for a short time before he was being promoted to detective um, where he remained until his retirement in 1946. Even though he worked in the detective bureau, Lester did not lose interest in the traffic light and continued to make improvements to it. Finally, he devised a durable metal stoplight using the smokestack from an old locomotive engine for the frame. This metal stoplight looked much like the stoplight today except that it did not have a yellow caution light. Um, Lester thought about having the traffic light, a patent taken out on it, but he found that he had waited too long and so he never received any monetary reward for uh, his invention. Um, he died on April 14, 1958, at the age of 70. In March, that's another picture of it. In March of, and this is his, where he's buried up in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. It also has a military headstone. In March, of 1963, the War Memorial Museum and Historical Society was started in his family home by his sister Edith. She had to secure, she tried to secure the original stoplight from Tracy Avery where it had actually been used as a bird. <laughs> but it had disappeared shortly after Wire's death. The original metal one had been on display in Syracuse, New York. But it had also dis disappeared when she um, asked to have it returned to Salt Lake City. Edith, Edith died in 1973. She left her money to keep the museum operating, but there wasn't enough money to do that. Trustees for her estate referred the problem to the courts. As a solution, the Utah State Department of Transportation agreed to use the assets of the estate to create and maintain a suitable memorial to the inventor of the traffic light. 
to that end, the Lester Farnsworth Wire Memorial Library was included in the Department of Transportation building located at 5400 South and 2700 West in Salt Lake City when it was being built. birthday in April 1880, Mary Parker was lured to the outskirts of the small southern Utah town of Rockville. There she was outraged and murdered. Her throat slit and her body left under a crude pile of rocks. Mary Parker's tragic story was once a sensational news item that shocked the rural community and was indignantly reported and followed throughout the state. Her presumed murderer was swiftly identified as Jared Dalton, the 22-year-old son of a prominent Latter-day Saint polygamist and his fifth wife. With such compelling elements as rape and murder, the possible involvement of co-conspirators, allusions to witchcraft, imprisonment at the territorial penitentiary, prison escape and recapture, anti-Mormon and polygamist tensions, and Jared's scandalous special treatment from the warden, it's a wonder that this story has nevertheless faded from the collective memory. A ghost town hidden near the mouth of Zion National Park. Today, Schoensburg is but a whisper on the dry wind of southwestern Utah. A handful of small rock ruins hint at the 19th century settlement that was frequently washed by the Virgin River and eventually abandoned after four decades of the pioneer struggle to make it their home. All that is left of the former civilization are a single stone building and a cemetery. Stark red walls of the canyon rise above the town's small grouping of grave markers and memorial stones. Here rests Mary Elizabeth Gifford Parker, buried in 1880, the year Schoensburg reached its peak population. Six miles west lies Schoensburg's sister town of Rockville. Throughout its history, Schoensburg was closely tied to the town at Rockville, its Latter-day Saint residents sharing a ward organization for the town's first 10 years. When conflict with the local Native Americans flared up, Schoensburg families were advised to seek shelter in Rockville, camping in tents outside of town. At times, Schoensburg farmers lived in Rockville while daily visiting their land in guarded groups to tend to their crops. It was thus no surprise that residents of Rockville were familiar with their Schoensburg neighbors in the late 1800s. Mary Parker was one woman who often came through town on foot taking care of her errands and sometimes stopping to chat with friends. Mary had been widowed less than a year, was the mother of several grown children, and had a few grandchildren as well. Her younger brother described Mary in a letter to the Deseret Evening News, quote, she was called a witch by many who were foolish enough to believe it, end quote. He remembered his sister as a, quote, strange woman and sometimes disagreeable in her manners, but was always true to the work of God, end quote. An accounting of Mary's tragic disappearance was written in Clarissa Isabel Wilhelm's autobiography some 50 years after the events took place. Clarissa had been a 10-year-old living with her family in Rockville at the time of the murder. She recalled that the family was all out in the yard one morning when old Mary Parker passed by and stopped to chat with Clarissa's mother. Mary was carrying a parcel and happily reported that it was her 62nd birthday and she had been invited to dinner at James Terry's home later that day. That birthday dinner would tur turn out to be Mary's last meal. Both Clarissa's autobiography and newspaper accounts mention that a young local man named Jared Dalton came to the Terry home during dinner and relayed a message to Mary Parker that her son Samuel wanted to see her. Due to having gotten into trouble with a woman and having been accused of stealing a saddle, Samuel feared to come into Rockville to see his mother, so he was reportedly waiting a few miles outside of town in the hillside. Mary set out on foot for the supposed meeting place, with the dark-haired Jared Dalton following on horseback. She was seen on the road by multiple witnesses, some of whom also saw Jared. By Sunday, people around town realized that Mary had not been seen since Friday evening, and it was determined that they would take up a hunt. So Monday morning, a group of citizens gathered where she had last been seen. 
The search party soon found tracks that led to a secluded place in the hills where it appeared that foul play had occurred. Shortly thereafter, about 50 feet from that spot, Mary's body had, was found lying head down between some large rocks. Upon an immediate inquest, the coroner found that her throat had been cut and there was heavy bruising on the back of her head and shoulders. She had also been outraged. Those involved in the inquest proposed that she was likely killed by a blow to the head from a large rock and their suspicions quickly landed on Jared due to the circumstantial evidence surrounding Mary's disappearance and his having been the last person to see her alive. The coroner requested an investigation which involved two men examining the tracks at the scene and the surrounding area. Only a single man's tracks were found along with one horse's tracks, which were reportedly an exact match to Jared's and his horse, suggesting that there had been only one perpetrator in the commission of this heinous crime. Arrested and taken to the Tokerville jail, Jared openly spoke with a reporter from the Silver Reef Miner a few weeks later, which interview was printed in multiple Utah newspapers. Jared was described as thick set and of medium height with a ruddy complexion and clearly feeling the weight of the charges against him. Jared repeated his story that Mary's son Samuel had met him on the range that morning, asking him to pass a message to his mother that he wanted to see her. Jared said he found Mary at the Terry home and relayed the message, even admitting that he saw Mary on the road later that day, but claiming he had only passed her on the road and had not accompanied her to her destination. The reporter asked if Jared had previously accused Mary of bewitching his cow, which Jared denied. He reported that he planned to plead not guilty, acknowledging that he would likely have a long wait in jail before the next district court term but Jared indicated that he would not try to escape. Naturally, the investigation continued with an attempt to locate Samuel Parker, as he had apparently been implicated by Jared in the crime. The surrounding towns were thoroughly searched, but Samuel was not found until several days after the murder, 175 miles north in the town of Deseret. Samuel appeared to not be aware of his mother's death and claimed to be heading back from Nevada where he had been herding sheep. He was arrested and brought back to Southern Utah for further inquiry. Mary's younger brother wrote into the newspaper in support of Samuel's innocence, speculating that Jared had fabricated Samuel's presence in the area as a way to get even with him over a previous land dispute a few years prior between Samuel and Jared that had led to a violent physical altercation which had been broken up by Mary. The man suggested perhaps this event had provoked Jared's murdering of his sister, as well as Jared's reasoning for casting suspicion on her son. When Jared heard Samuel had been found and was being brought to town, he was immediately fearful that Samuel would shoot him and beg to not be left alone. At his next meal, he asked the jailer to bring him a sheet of paper. Jared proceeded to confess to the murder in the presence of witnesses, claiming that he and another local man named George Jennings had outraged Mary. Afterwards, Jared said that one of them held her while the other slit her throat. Together, they had hidden the body. After this confession, Jared then said he was tired of living and requested to be shot. When asked why he gave up George as a co-conspirator, he said it was because George had neglected to bring him tobacco at the jail after he had promised to do so. George Jennings was arrested and examined over the period of a week, although evidence against him was found to be insufficient and he was quickly discharged. Asked again about the confession, Jared stated that he would stick to this version of the events to his dying day. There was no evidence found by the prosecution which would point to George having been involved in the crime. George had also been seen by various witnesses throughout the af that afternoon at his brother's home where he was boarding, although there was some question of exactly what time his witnesses had seen him, since they were judging the time by the position of the sun in the sky and not by a clock. Jared did stick to this story for the next few months, continuing to implicate George as the one who had cut Mary's throat, and George was rearrested on September 6th. When it was time for George's hearing, the Utah Southern passenger train made a special stop to pick up Jared from the Utah Penitentiary, accompanied by a U.S. Marshal to bring him back to the Second District Court in Beaver to stand as witness against George. The only evidence presented against George was Jared's testimony that they had been drinking together when he claimed George said, quote, there's an old writ that ought to be got away with, end quote. He testified that he had lured her to the hills where, Jer where George knocked her over, pulled out a knife, and slit her throat. 
Jared claimed they had together dumped her body among rocks and covered her with brush. By the end of the hearing, Jared decided to withdraw his guilty plea, and with no testimony corroborating Jared's claims against him, George was discharged for the second and final time. Jared was then arraigned and returned to the penitentiary to await his trial. During the second district court's December term, Jared was arraigned and charged with first degree murder. Jury selection was unsuccessful and more names had to be pulled. Other cases filled the docket and Jared's case was pushed to the March term. He was returned to the Utah Penitentiary in Salt Lake to await the next territorial district court session. Finally, in March of 1881, nearly a year after the murder, Jared's case came to trial in a crowded courtroom due to the significant public interest in Mary Parker's cruel death. In a newspaper recounting of the trial, Jared was depicted as, quote, short, heavy set, thick necked, and broad between the ears, end quote. <laughs> the case was heard by Judge Twiss in a trial that lasted from Monday through Wednesday. The jury was out for two hours and returned with a decision at 10 p.m. on Wednesday night. They found that Jared had indeed induced Mary to go to the hills falsely hoping to see her son, and that he subsequently returned from the same direction of where her body was found. The verdict was murder in the second degree. Judge Twist sentenced Jared to 12 years of hard labor at the Utah Penitentiary. Upon completion of the other cases being heard by the second district court two weeks later, 33 prisoners were brought from Beaver to the penitentiary on the Utah Southern passenger train. A large crowd gathered at the depot to see them. Now being referred to in the papers as, quote, the assassin and ravisher of old mother Parker, end quote, Jared and the other convicted murderer were taken from the train in irons, completing their journey to the pen in a bandwagon. In the public opinion, the jury had erred on too light of a sentence, feeling that Jared should have been found guilty of first degree murder instead of second. Living conditions at the pen were rather base. Men were grouped into three large bunk houses lined with two or three tiers of bunk beds, two men assigned to each bed. The straw mattresses crawled with lice and men freely spat tobacco juice, careless of whether it might land on the ground or on another man's face. The stench of a latrine bucket in the corner was almost intolerable. Perhaps understandably, it wasn't long before Jared got himself into trouble at the pen. In late December of 1881, on an early morning assignment to work in the prison bakehouse, Jared and another prisoner named George Hayes took advantage of the guards turned back and slipped out the back door. At 6 a.m., the morning was still very dark. The guard quickly discovered the men's absence and pursued. Hearing them run, he shot at them, but missed. Two other guards with lanterns immediately began following Jared and George's tracks in the fresh snow. Four hours later at about 10 a.m., the guards came across the runaways about two miles beyond Jenkins Farm across the Jordan. They were returned to their old quarters and placed in irons. Reportedly disliked by other inmates, being looked upon as vile and degraded, Jared nevertheless came into the good graces of the warden and was perceived to be a pet of the marshal. Even despite his successful escape, he was soon entrusted to the position of a trustee, which allowed for the chance of working outside the prison walls. In fact, Jared's duties afforded him the shocking liberty of driving the penitentiary wagon solo outside the prison walls to deliver goods produced by the prisoners into Salt Lake City. This privilege was claimed to be attributed to his not being a Mormon. He was perceived to be treated so kindly by the prison officers because of his, quote, bitter hatred and loud denunciation of the Mormons, treated more as a respected employee than a prisoner, end quote. This favored treatment of such a hard criminal makes more sense when considering the political climate of the Utah Territory during the period of time when Jared was serving his prison sentence. While the federal government's interest in quashing the Mormon practice of polygamy had been addressed off and on in the courts for decades, the appointment of Eli Murray as governor of the territory in 1880 marked a period of notable ch change in Utah as he, quote, united with a clique of liberals most hostile to the Latter-day Saints and soon became the executive agent of the anti-Mormon ring, end quote. Just four years and 11 months after Jared began serving his 12-year sentence, eight prison guards signed their names on a short letter written to Governor Murray petitioning for Jared's release. They cited his, quote, 
good behavior and cheerfulness in obeying all the rules of the prison, end quote, as well as his service as a faithful trustee for three or four years. Just two, two weeks before his replacement was to take office, Governor Murray issued a handful of last minute pardons, including one for Jared Dalton. Like the petition letter from the guards, Murray's official pardon refers to Jared's, quote, universally good conduct, end quote, during his time at the penitentiary, curiously making no mention of his successful escape in 1881. The pardon document itself introduces a new version of the murder events as presented to Murray by U.S. Marshal E.A. Ireland. Quote, Dalton was, at the time of the occurrence of the crime, an ignorant young man filled with superstition and believing in witchcraft, and it also appearing that while he did not commit the murder, he was led into inducing the supposed witch to go into a canyon where she was murdered by a party who fled this country. During his confinement, he has educated himself, has developed into another and different life, and looks back with horror upon the condition of mind that could tolerate the thought of such barbarous conduct." End quote. Jared was issued relief money upon his release and was then free to take up a normal life. Jared was drawn north to Ogden, where he spent the remaining 42 years of his life. Ogden was an interesting choice for Jared's new home, having then a rough and tumble reputation, which Al Capone is rumored to have said was too wild even for him. <laughs> Eight months after Jared Dalton's release from the penitentiary, another murder took place in Parowan, Utah. Although Jared was not involved in the crime, he nevertheless once again found his name splashed across the newspapers. His half-nephew, Edward Meeks Dalton, who had two wives, had been shot in the back by a U.S. Marshal while attempting to flee capture for the unlawful cohabitation charge against him. Edward was killed, becoming an unintended martyr for the cause of Mormon polygamy. He had been a good-natured and highly regarded member of his Mormon community who viewed him as having been shot down in cold blood. A flurry of impassioned newspaper articles and letters to the editor revealed much about Utah's pre-statehood political climate. Mormons bemoaned the incident as evidence of ruthless oppression, while the non-Mormon government officials and their sympathizers sought to besmirch Edward's character by connecting him to his half-uncle's infamous murder conviction. Descriptions of the heinous crime Jared had been convicted of committing accompanied articles that argued for leniency in Edward's killer's trial. Simply being somewhat closely related to Jared made Edward's death seem more justified to some, although calls for more responsible journalism perhaps tempered the debate in the newspapers at least. Jared's post-imprisonment life appears to have been much tamer than his younger years although still dusted with questions that may never be answered. For instance, who would marry and raise a family with a notorious confessed murderer? About a year after his prison release, at the age of 28, Jared married 17-year-old Matilda Horrocks in Ogden. Parts of Matilda's tragic backstory remain to be further explored. Being such a young woman at the time of her marriage, and having been orphaned by the age of eight, Matilda was perhaps not protected by guardians who might have had parental aversion to her union with a man having such a reputation. It is not known how Jared and Matilda met, and no official record of their marriage has been found. Through his adult life, Jared supported the family through working as a herdsman and a teamster. He and Matilda raised three sons and two daughters. Neither diaries nor family accounts seem to have been preserved that could provide insight into what family life was like in the Dalton household. The question remains, was Jared Dalton ever reformed? Did his excommunication from the church of his youth or the several years of his life spent in prison have a positive impact on the quality of his character? A search through the written record reveals only small tidbits of information about Jared's post-incarceration life. In May of 1890, Jared paid $1 in costs for indecent exposure. No further information was found about this particular incident. However, close to a quarter century later, at the age of 55, Jared was once again reported about in the local newspapers. On a Sunday afternoon in May of 1913, he was driving a horse rig in Ogden when a local woman named Kate Cragen began crossing the road on foot at the intersection of Washington and 24th Streets. Jared's horse struck the woman, who was knocked to the ground and subsequently kicked by the horse. Mrs. Cragen was rendered momentarily unconscious and suffered bruises on her head and shoulders. Witnesses carried her into a nearby drugstore, 
while Jared reportedly drove away without so much as stopping to ensure the injured woman was okay. The situation thus resulted in a brief police chase. A patrolman followed Jared's rig in an automobile, apprehending him three blocks down the street and taking him to jail, with court scheduled for the next day. Jared was never rebaptized into the LDS church, and his immediate family members' names were also not found in the official church records in Ogden, where Jared and his wife lived until his death by pneumonia in 1928 at the age of 70, although his obituary mentions that his funeral was presided over by the Ogden 19th Ward Bishop. In cards of thanks following the funeral, Jared's family described him as a beloved husband, father, and brother. Okay, well we only have a few minutes, so I'm going to keep my comments really brief here, but um, these papers are a lot of fun, aren't they? Um, I'm going to start and just say a few things about Linda's paper which gives us a delightful window into what I would call the infrastructure that we take for granted now. And that's, that infrastructure includes things like poles and lights and traffic signals, but it also includes things like laws and regulations. And it also includes the internalization and expectation of those laws and regulations on the part of pe everyday people, right? That, that our um, compliance and expectation and, uh, and um, just going along with those kinds of regulations is part of the infrastructure of modern life, too. Um, I was a little curious about context, since he seems to have been the first to invent the traffic signal, um, but it would be interesting to know more about what's the status of traffic regulation in the country generally at this time. It must have been a, con a lively conversation, excuse me, that was going on elsewhere. Um, I, I wondered if he originated the red-green system, was that his idea, red for stop and green for go? And and then, of course, the discussion about women drivers. I mean, that's fascinating. <laughs> and um, there's actually a, some interesting scholarship on women drivers during this period. But um, it's interesting to think about that in terms of gender. Like, I can't imagine that what they said about women drivers, you know, some of them being incompetent. I'm, I can't imagine that wasn't true about some of the male drivers, too. But, um, Okay, then let's talk about murder for a minute. So murder trials seem to always have been big news, right? And like a lot of other sensational events, they're a nine days wonder and then they disappear from the public memory. And we have two such examples right here. Um, I just wanted to raise a few um, questions about this, but maybe I'll... Um, Maybe I'll, I'll leave most of that for other people if they want to ask questions. The, the religious aspects of the, of the Mortensen case are really interesting. 1901 is still a period when there's a lot of Mormon, non-Mormon tension under the surface in Salt Lake City and not so far under the surface all the time. And so I, I'd be interested to know more about how that played into the, both the, the case and the way it's tried and also the way that it's covered in the newspapers. Um, when I did, I, I got roped into commenting on this session because somebody knows that I've been working on a sensational murder trial myself from 1890, which is the first woman in Utah to be tried for capital murder. And um, what I found in looking at that case is that you have to really attend to which newspaper you're getting your information from during this period. Because you have the Deseret News, which is kind of the voice of the Mormon church. You have the Salt Lake Tribune, which is kind of the polar opposite and quite antagonistic. And then you have the Salt Lake Herald, which is mostly a Mormon paper and more sympathetic to the Mormons. And so it kind of makes a difference which source you're getting your, your material from. And um, so that's something um, to, to keep in mind when we, when we find the, the reports about, about cases like this. Um, so that was one thing I was interested in both of these murder cases to know more about is the press coverage and if they saw those kinds of things. I was interested to know as well, particularly in Becca's case, like what source base exists for um, excavating this. And you know, I could see some of that in the notes. I could see some of that on her slides. If we had time, I'd be interested to have her comment on that. I know when I went back to try and find like trial transcripts and things from my 1890 case, most of it's not there. And so I had to rely on the newspaper um, cases. Um, 
Jared Dalton is an interesting illustration of what I would call generational dynamics in Mormondom <laughs> and a reminder that Utah was very much the Wild West in ways that the you know traditional Mormon mythical story of Zion doesn't always account for and that by the late 19th century you have this second sometimes third generation coming of age whose ties to the religion of their parents are um, maybe not as internalized, shall we say, as it was for their parents. And so the religious dynamics play out in, in interesting ways there. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. Let's, let's field a few questions in the couple of minutes that we have left. If our panelists want to come up and make themselves available. <clears throat> yeah, and get water if you want. Kevin, do you want Okay, right here. Not a question. I saw a film some time, quite, quite some time back, I think late 80s or early 90s, that there was a young man, a very accomplished photographer, who disappeared down in southern Thinking they know more, and they never nobody it seems ever yeah, learned. I don't think they ever found the body. No. Yeah, mm -hmm. some interesting elements in that one, and of course the idea of gay as an identity is just barely starting to register in the late nineteenth century. So yeah. that's interesting. Other questions? Anybody? Um, so, did you get most of your information from the newspapers, or um, I saw that you had some of the? Or on, I forget, but. Uh, the court transcripts and the and the pardon. Um, how did you find those? In my case, with the Dalton story, most of the information was in the newspapers. Um, the case file was either missing or had burned down with the Beaver huh. um, courthouse being burnt down. So the, there were no case files to look at. But the, as much as was reported in the newspapers for that. Um, there were court minutes, um, but being as early as it was 1881 for the trial, um, a lot of the potential files that could have been consulted are just not existing for the, that time period for that district court. I, I haven't gotten to the archive. There are, are there are some transcripts in the archives. The Mortensen case was so plastered over. I mean, there were four newspapers, and interestingly, they all kind of had the same outlook there there wasn't a whole bunch of different the interesting thing is the district attorney was not LDS he's buried in Mount Olivet yeah. Bernard Barnard Stewart who was a defense lawyer was very much uh, a Mormon and in fact close friend of both Mortensen and Hay uh, he lived in the same neighborhood in fact when after Mortensen was executed uh, Stewart lived in his house for the next 10 or 15 years um, but there there doesn't seem to be a whole bunch of, of Mormon uh, it is never mentioned that the lovely design he had for the Forest Dale Ward, it, there is no church stuff talked about with respect to Mortensen at all, at least in the newspapers. That's interesting. That's interesting. Oh, in my case, um, Edith Weir wrote a biography of Lester, and a lot of my information came from that. But as far as the laws and things like that, I got that out of the newspaper. Yeah, I like that, that he was going with the sight of 16-year-old shit and ride. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool, but that's where that came from. Something we can still get behind. Uh, I saw a hand over here. Uh, yeah, I was interested, Linda, about, about the sources, and I also heard that there are a couple of other claims across the country for you know, the inventor of the traffic so I wondered what the, what the sources are and well and, and how you know how do you weigh the claims? Yeah, no. Um, 
Well, I'll be truthful. I had a nice file on Lester Wire when I left the Historical Society. That has never emerged since. <laughs> <laughs> and in it, in it I, there was a little article about, I think it was someone in Cincinnati, who he, he claims to have invented the first uh, traffic signal. So, you know, I, I think it's kind of, I should have said it's kind of up there. Did, did he introduce it, the red-green? Yeah, he did do the red-green. He actually, um, how he, he took bulbs and he painted them. Uh, that they didn't exist at that time. They didn't so. use a Coke bottle or something. Uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm still looking for that file, and I ask for it every time I go down there. But no. <laughs> Well, and I was interested that, that the word efficiency kept yeah. showing up. Yeah. I mean, this is the progressive era, right? It is. It's all about efficiency, and that's what that's a, a imperative that's playing out around the country mm -hmm. everywhere in a lot of ways during this period. You know, on, on women, I just want to say women drivers, there are two great photographs of the Historical Society. One of them is Mrs. Jacob Morowitz. Jacob Morowitz was the owner of the Salt Lake Brewery, and he's also the guy buried in Emo's grave, if you're from Salt Lake City, up in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. He was very wealthy. His wife, there's a great picture of her on Main Street in their brand new car, which will go 65 miles an hour, and she's the only woman driving, and there are six petrified looking men in the car with her, <laughs> and it says she went from there and drove up South Temple going 50 miles an hour. <laughs> and then there's another great photograph of a bunch of women in beautiful, you know, 1910 uh, dresses in front of the uh, William Godby House on First South. So at least there are two great photographs of women driving these, and it was the same. It's the same model of car. It's in the same month. It was when it was introduced. The cars cost like seven, eight thousand dollars, which in nineteen yeah, oh eight or nine would have been fabulously wow, expensive. Yeah. Anyway. Great. Okay. Photograph. One last question. Okay. In the uh, Mortensen Hay murder, at that period of time, weren't there quite a few ex executions in Utah, for example, Joe Hill? Were a lot of them circumstantial? I mean, it wasn't really. Joe Hill. Joe Hill's pretty much circumstantial. He had a bullet wound. You know, they'd shot somebody. Whoever robbed the, the store and killed the store owner and his wife. Uh, there were other circumstantial cases, and in fact, one of the interesting things about sources is is the Utah Supreme Court appeal decisions are pretty bizarre. For example, one of the bases it was appealed on was this crazy, not crazy, interesting revelation from from uh, from James Sharp said, you know, you can't convict him on the basis of that. The jury was tainted. Uh, and and the court ruled that because uh, the defense had introduced this, that y you can't attack evidence that you introduce yourself. Well, the reason the defense had introduced it was because everyone in Salt Lake City knew the story already, and they had to t attack it. And so the only way to do that was to bring it out, because the prosecution wasn't going to have him say, yes, God told me that I know that you killed him and that you buried him over here. So... Mm -hmm. It, uh, but uh, yeah, there were other cases with circumstantial evidence, absolutely. Did they ever find out who actually did it? Oh, I think, do I, th I think Morrison actually probably, I don't think he got a fair trial. I think he probably killed him. Although interestingly, the family tradition in the Stewart family, which I'm related to, um, is that the lawyers thought he was innocent. Not, not guilty, but actually innocent. So. I think he was probably guilty. I just don't think he was convicted probably. Well, and this is one of this is why murder trials fascinate us so much, I think, is because it takes us into this realm of human nature and it why does. it's this unfathomable question of why people do what they do. And that's why these trials just never get old. <laughs> okay, well thank you everybody. Thank you. Have a good evening. Good job. Good job. Thanks.